Okay, uh, thank you, Paul. And uh, I, let's see, I, I probably have more slides than I could really cover in, in 30 minutes, so I'm gonna go through things fairly quickly, and what I encourage you is just you know, ask questions anytime on things that you see in the slides that I just gloss over quickly, or things that you were hoping to see that maybe I don't cover. And uh, let's just make this interactive. Let's take advantage of the time we have. Um, if I don't get through all the slides, that's okay. They'll be posted, and you can take a look at them later. Uh, but what I want to talk to you about today is, obviously you're familiar with DevNet. You're here in the DevNet zone. Um, hopefully you're finding uh, there's lots of useful information and learning that ha that's happening here. One of the new things that we've added into uh, DevNet is our open source dev center. So I'm here to tell you about that and some information about open source in general. So uh, the agenda. First of all, you know, you, you're probably hearing about open source a lot. Um, I think the only time I remember hearing perhaps more about open source was like in the late 90s, uh, just before the, the bubble burst. But now there's, there's a bunch of excitement around it again, and I think the reasons for it are a bit different. So we're gonna talk about why is there so much excitement? Why is everyone interested in open source? Uh, what we're doing at Cisco uh, around open source? Then I'll talk to you very briefly about DevNet, but I think you already know that, so I won't spend much time on that. And then I'll spend the majority of the time I have left talking about the open source dev center and just giving you a feel for what's in there. And then wrap it up with a few uh, takeaways. So why open source? Uh, you know, I think the first thing that probably just about everyone thinks of when they think of open source is, well, you know, hey, it's free. I don't need to pay anything for the software. I can just use it. That's, that's fantastic. Well, it isn't really free. I mean, the reality of it is you're going to have costs, whether it be that you need to train your people up to understand it, it's gonna be support models, um, you're still gonna to need to pay the equipment for it to run on, so there's all kinds of other costs I think you need to think about. So I would say the fact that open source at least is free to download and use is not the reason you should use open source. There, there's many other good reasons. Um, this is something uh, I found on the Red Hat website. We, we partner very closely with Red Hat. I thought this was a particularly uh, good uh, quote, so I just put it up here. You know, they're saying when we talk about open source, we're talking about a proven way of collaborating whoa, <laughs> uh, to create technology, the freedom to see the code, to learn from it, to ask questions and offer improvements. This is the open source way. And that, I, I put this quote up because I thought that just really hit on most of the things that are key to me as a developer as to why I really um, love open source and find it a great, a great way uh, to work. Maybe looking a little bit more at the uh, business side of things, this is uh, another quote where uh, Howard Baldwin, he's emphasizing that you know, it's not just about saving money, it's, uh, it's about this agility that you get from open source, the speed with which open source uh, development happens when you have a diverse, wide, large community of people moving something forward. Just the sheer number of resources that you have out there working on the projects um, allows them to move forward at a pace that really no individual company can keep up with. And this is another important point I wanted to hit. I mentioned Red Hat, you know, one of the uh, companies we work with in open source, but there's a whole bunch. And this is by no means an exhaustive list, but this is just to give you an idea of um, all the partners we are working very closely with in and around open source. You've probably been able to see a lot of their uh, demonstrations in the DevNet zone, um, and certainly in the world of solutions. And the point I want to drive home here is that we also participate with them in uh, standardization forms, like in the IETF. And I think the best of both worlds is when you have open source that's grounded uh, or has its foundations in standards. And the great thing about that is you not only get code uh, that moves very fast and that um, a bunch of people are working with, but you almost get, uh, you get pretty much automatic interoperability because people aren't just working with supporting the same standards, they're actually using the same code that supports those standards. So uh, interoperability is much, much better across uh, platforms that have a, a variety of equipment from vendors. 
So I touched on most of the, uh, the pros there already when I went through the quotes. As I mentioned, there are some costs to open source. Um, you, in order to really get all these benefits that I've been talking about, you or, or whoever in your company is working with this open source needs to have a deep understanding of open source. Otherwise, you won't benefit from the fact that you have complete visibility into it. Uh, the deployment complexity, that comes in because open source, if you look at it, it's generally written for a wide range of platforms. So there is some customization that's going to be needed uh, when you go to take it and run it on your own platform. It's not like when you get something from a vendor and it's an appliance and you just turn it on and it works. With open source, you generally need to download it, build it for the platform you want it to run on, and then you may need to make some uh, customizations there. The support model, uh, the open source community is great at providing open source, especially for developers. But when something goes wrong, if it's mission critical and you need 24 seven support, you're not gonna get that from the open source community. If you need someone to call at any time of day who can help you out with a problem, you better find a, um, a vendor who is supporting the open source and can provide that for you. And then of course, you, you need to understand the licensing so that you don't get yourself into a situation where you're using open source that says what we call copy left, which basically has a viral effect. Um, when you use that open source and combine it with any of your own code, your own code that it's combined with becomes open source too and falls under the same license. That's not the case with all open source, but it is with some. So you just need to make sure you understand what you're doing and that you understand the licensing and the implications of it. And I think the way I would really look at it is I would look at open source options as well as non-open source options and then just figure out which is the best one for you. And it really, it, you know, it has to solve your problem. It has to be a, a solid open source project with a good community behind it. And just to go a little more quickly, I think you need to think of the total cost of ownership, everything that comes with it. You may not be paying anything for the licensing, but you may have other costs that come in with support and, and uh, getting trained up on it. And I think I touched on this a bit earlier, but from a developer point of experience, how many of you are developers write code? Yeah, so for you, and for me, I mean, I think it's a no-brainer. Open source is just great. It has all these benefits, and I really can't think of a downside of open source. Um, you get to see and play with all the code. You get to change it. Uh, you get to work with a large community. Uh, you learn new skills just by seeing what other people do, their coding styles. You have a bunch of eyes on your code that are going to give you comments, um, much more so than if it's just the five people maybe in your team at your company. Uh, you're able to showcase your talents to the world, which I think is great, and you work on something which is used by a large, diverse company so it's, or, or set of people. So it's not just like you worked on some proprietary little niche software for 10 years, and now you're, you know, you're just tied into your one employer. I think you're much more employable when you work on these various open source projects that everyone else is using and familiar with. So now I'm gonna switch gears and talk a little bit about open source at Cisco and what it means to Cisco. And I threw up a quote here from uh, uh, Martin Roche. He, uh, he was saying, Cisco isn't just saying they're dedicated to open source, they're making it happen. And what he's referring to is uh, we bought Sourcefire. How many of you have heard of Sourcefire? Okay, and the uh, Snort uh, is the underlying open source project there. When Cisco acquired them, it, we kept it as a vibrant open source community. If you go, you'll see that the Snort open source project is just as active now as before we acquired um, Sourcefire. And so we have every intention of doing that and continuing to make it uh, grow and thrive and use it within our products. And if you've been around in the DevNet zone this week, you've probably heard other people, uh, like when we had the um, leaders of, of our cloud group, and you would have heard Ken Owens and Lou Tucker talk about all we're doing with OpenStack, and you've probably heard um, uh, Dave Ward talk about all we're doing around Open Daylight. We have large teams of people in Cisco who are contributing directly into these projects. We're not just using it, we're, we're giving back to the community and making those projects better. And this is just to show you that this isn't a recent trend for Cisco. We've been contributing to open source and using it all along, including uh, a lot of contributions to the Linux kernel you know, in the early days. So this, again, is not an exhaustive list. It just lists 
some of the things, and I would go so far as to say that most, if not every single product or solution within Cisco has um, open source within it. And I think that's one of the great things is that when you go into these products, if you're able to be exposed to or see what open source makes it up, it just gives you a whole nother level with which you can work with Cisco um, when you're integrating into those products. And, and that's where I think DevNet comes in, right? Because that's the whole mission of DevNet. DevNet is our developer program, and the whole idea there is to enable you to build uh, compelling and innovative apps by helping you understand our, our software, our solutions, our APIs, or in this case, the open source that we're using and how you can work with us in those open source communities. And as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, uh, one of the new things we've added is this open source dev center. This is where you can go to find out everything that's going on that a developer would care about around open source at Cisco. You can see what projects we're contributing to, what it is we're contributing, how we're using it within our own uh, products and solutions. We have forums there where you can interact with the um, Cisco developers who are working in those projects in those communities. Uh, developer VMs, a bunch of events that we do around open source, like the IETF hackathon, where I mentioned earlier, kind of the best case scenario where you have open source that has its foundations and standards. Well, what we do here is we go in and the standards that we're working on with other companies, we write open source implementations of those to move those standards forward and flush out any problems with those standards early on rather than years later when you know everyone has their own proprietary implementation, you plug them together and you see they don't quite work because everyone implemented the standard a little different. OpenStack, how many of you know, familiar with OpenStack? Okay, just about everyone. So I'm not gonna teach you or, or try to uh, give you really an overview of OpenStack. Um, it's a cloud computing platform Form for uh, public and private clouds. But what's more important that I want you to know is that we do have a, a whole site within DevNet dedicated to OpenStack, which will tell you about everything that Cisco is doing with OpenStack, contributing to it, using it, and so on. Uh, for example, this is one of the overview slides you'd find within that, um, that site if you went there, highlighting Cisco's involvement with OpenStack, our code contributions into various OpenStack projects, and then how that, uh, the ramifications of that within our solutions. Open Daylight, another huge open source project, right? Seems like I see some heads nodding. You guys are probably familiar with this. So this is just, you know, uh, Open Daylight is uh, a controller for software-defined networking. Basically a modular controller in the middle with northbound APIs for applications, southbound APIs to plug into various networking gear. And uh, the Open Daylight controller forms the heart of Cisco's OpenSDN controller. So when you go to the DevNet site, it's things like that that we try to get across to you. We try to show you, okay, looking at the OpenSDN controller, what components from Open Daylight does it use? That's all these things in the middle. Those are common components that we decided to uh, use directly from the open source. Uh, open Daylight controller. And you can see on the right-hand side, there's some kind of value-add things that we thought we needed to add to make it a really hardened commercial version that we could support. And I think what you'll see is that over time, if it's useful, a lot of this stuff that's in blue will probably find its way back into the Open Daylight controller um, because that's good for everyone. It advances Open Daylight it is better for Cisco because if, if we keep this stuff just in the Cisco branch, every single time as, as the Open Daylight controller is advancing and there's a new re release of Open Daylight, we'll have to go and make sure that all of our things that we add on top of it still work with that new version. That's gonna be a pain. So we're constantly taking things from here and moving them back into the Open Daylight or even working directly on the components that are already in Open Daylight. That way, we get the best of both worlds, and every other vendor is kind of set up the same way, right? Everyone has an incentive to contribute to the Open Daylight project directly. That's the great thing about open source. <laughs>
A couple other things, I think I already mentioned Snort. You can go to our site and see more about Snort. Um, OpenH264, I just wanted to show this one because are any of you in the collab space are familiar with WebRTC, perhaps? WebRTC, yeah. So WebRTC is uh, really making it very easy to add audio and video capabilities into any application because you get them within your browser. So just like you would access any capabilities within a browser, like to pop up a window, uh, for, for the same amount of work, you can now add audio and video into it. And so we contributed uh, an H.264 a codec implementation, um, and we also pay all the licensing fees because we, we wanted to make sure that the best and most widely used video codec in the industry was, was out there. So now Mozilla has added this into their browser, so when you download Mozilla and you're using it, any application has access to that implementation of H.264. And, and not only do they use it, but we actually use this implementation ourselves with, with uh, WebEx and with other video applications that we have within Cisco. Just a few other things I wanted to hit on very quickly. These are pretty much true for all of uh, Dev, DevNet, and, but uh, I want to add specific examples in terms of open source. So, Learning labs. We have learning labs where you can go and you can play around with a certain technology, learn a bit, you know, kind of get your hands dirty, uh, spending half an hour to an hour learning some technology. In this example, the idea is that you spin up a virtual machine on your own laptop and you bring up an OpenStack cloud within it. And then you interoperate with it, either at the admin level, where you're setting up the entire cloud and creating all your tenants within it, or at the tenant level where you look at the resources that are allocated to you and spin up VMs within that, create networks within that. Um, so you kind of get an idea of what it would mean from an operator point of view to uh, work in a cloud environment. Going one step deeper, we have our sandbox environment. And here, this example is with the open daylight controller. What you can do here is schedule some time in the sandbox. You can go and spin up a open daylight controller, but not just an open daylight controller, but also have an instance of viral along with that that provides a complete uh, network for you, for the controller to interact with. So now you can use APIs provided by the uh, open daylight controller to uh, interact with a network and see how that goes. And then just taking that even one step further, if you actually want to start coding and contributing code to Open Daylight or to OpenStack. What we've provided here are these developer VMs. What happens with that is you download that to your laptop, spin it up within VirtualBox or VMware Fusion, whatever your favorite uh, environment is for that. And now you have a complete development environment with all the tools you need. You'll find that each open source project has, has a set of tools that you need, not just to develop code, but also to commit that code uh, back into their source or to build it or to run automated tests. What we try to do is provide everything you need within this VM so you can get up and running very quickly. Uh, if you want to, you can then go and customize it and you can you know, download all these tools natively on your own laptop. But especially if you work with a bunch of different open source projects, you might actually find that this is more efficient for you. Because then you, know, you just spin up one VM and you've got your whole open daylight environment. You spin up another one, you have your old, you know, your own open stack environment. Otherwise, it's just too much stuff, too many environments to keep on one system. OK, and with that, uh, let me go and just try to wrap some of this up. So I know I went through a lot of things pretty quickly, but I just wanted to give you a flavor of why open source is important to Cisco and what we're doing in DevNet around open source. And so the main things to keep in mind is that at Cisco, we contribute very actively to a wide range of open source projects. Uh, we use the, that open source quite extensively in most, if not all, of our pro, uh, pro, products and solutions. Um, when you participate in open source, everyone who does participate gets, gets huge benefits. If you don't participate in it, you just like use it, you get some of those benefits, but if you want to get the maximum benefits out of open source, you need to really be engaged. And that doesn't mean you need to 
even write code for it. You may just be submitting bug reports. You may be helping with documentation that was ambiguous or wrong or just not clear. So there's lots of ways to work with an open source uh, pro uh, project and contribute to it. In fact, we just had a course all day Saturday here where it was about OpenStack and how to become an OpenStack contributor. And we had people there who had never coded before, so we didn't try to teach them to program. What we showed them was, okay, there's all this stuff in the OpenStack community. There's the code, but there's also all the documentation. And now you can help make that documentation better. For example, you could fix a bug that's in the documentation and contribute to the community that way. Or you could you know, create bugs based on your own use of OpenStack, right? And report in a detailed manner, here, these are the problems you ran into. So there's lots of ways to contribute. It's not just uh, uh, by writing code. The other thing to keep in mind, uh, DevNet, and it's your source for open source at Cisco. Everything related to open source at Cisco and what we're doing that a developer would care about, you can find here at this URL, developer.cisco.com slash open source. Um, the one disclaimer we'll throw out there, we just stood this side up pretty recently. So it's not going to have everything in the world covered in excruciating detail yet, but it's going to be growing quickly. And I'd say that's somewhere where I, you know, I ask for your help. Um, let me know things that are important to you because that'll help me prioritize. I know OpenStack and Open Daylight are very important to a lot of people. So those are the first two I've really keyed on. I mentioned Snort, that's another one I plan on hitting uh, and providing more information on. But let me know other things that you use at Cisco that you would like to see there. And uh, I'll do my best to make sure they get um, covered better there. And with that, I'd like to open it up for questions. There is a mic going around, so if you can grab that. Hi. Um I wanted to ask, and, and this is probably, I don't know, maybe a sensitive subject, but w a lot of the OSs now with Cisco, uh, XE, XR, and XS are, um, are based on Linux, so that's like a, you know, a binary that we get that's in a package still, so um, how, are, how are you guys making sure that you're following the GPL and, and all those legal issues that, you know, you talked about earlier with, with operating systems as well? Yeah, I mean, that, that gets really tricky at the operating system level, but there are um, like kernel loadable modules that you can use. So if there's something that is GPL code, you could, if you can bring it in as a kernel loadable module as opposed to something you actually built with the kernel, then you can have different, different licensing around it. So for example, if the Linux kernel's GPL, but you have your own uh, vendor specific stuff, that's what you can do. You can write it separately. You can load it in as one of these modules. So, I mean, we have a lot of people at Cisco who obviously know that a lot better than I do, but that's, that's how we're careful to really understand um, all the ramifications of the open source. And GPL is one of those ones that, yeah, you, you have to be, be very careful with. And just, in some cases, it turns out that you can't use the code that you would like to. You have to come up with your own implementation. But you know, we work very actively in the Linux Foundation and have helped put things in place so that not just for us, but for other companies that have valuable things to contribute, that they can still contribute without hurting themselves due to the licensing. Any other questions? Things you wanted to see that I didn't talk about or things that you're hoping you'll see in the DevNet uh, Open Source Dev Center that's not there? Yeah. So how would you make a living as an open source developer? Is the mic on? I, I can't hear you. I heard it. Um, how would you make a living as an open source developer? Right, you're contributing all your code free. I'm just curious. I mean, I have ideas. But yeah. How can you, you know, have a career doing that and still feed the kids? Well, I, <laughs> in reality, I've, I've seen it um, work a few different ways. Um, so as an open source developer, at Cisco, I get paid by Cisco. Um, before that, I worked at Bovida Networks, and we were a startup company making a you know, meager salary, and then everything we were writing was contributed to open source, and, and Cisco acquired us. So, so, so in both cases, I guess Cisco was ended up funding what I was doing. Um, 
in some cases, uh, you do have open source contributors who are uh, going to university and it's kind of just a learning thing for them or going towards their, their master's program or PhD. You also have people who, um, oh, what's the, I'm trying to think if it's open SSL. One of the open source projects that just like everyone uses and this guy just does it all in his own time and uh, what ended up happening was that the Linux Foundation said, hey, we have some, uh, we need to spend more time on OpenSSL. You're the guy that knows it the best. Um, and, and they actually you know, like sponsored him to spend more time on OpenSSL. So oftentimes people do get funded one way or another when they're working on open source, either by their, because their, their company pays for them to do it or one of these other means. So. Um, and I mentioned before, it's a great way to showcase your skills. Uh, so when you're contributing to open source, you're active in the community, people see that and they look and they say, hey, where's this guy work? Oh, he's just you know, a student or he's just freelancing. Hey, maybe we should hire him. So I, I don't know, I think there's lots of ways to make money through open source. Yeah, any other questions? I would also add that you know working in a very stringent corporate environment with a lot of rules, one way that I've been able to keep myself technically sharp and flexible is to use you know use open source as as a practice lab you know in in my own home and it's it's been really a godsend to me technically because I'm already up to speed on a lot of this stuff you know yeah yeah I would say it's interesting when. The corporate level people maybe weren't quite as familiar with open source. I saw a lot of people contributing to open source just sort of under the radar, kind of like, you know, don't ask, don't tell type thing. Um, now at Cisco and other places, I think there's much more awareness that open source is important and you, you're finding that uh, most large companies or even smaller companies, they have a whole um, support structure now around open source to make sure that you're careful about the licensing and that you understand what you're doing when you contribute to open source, when you use open source. And um, I think it's good. I think it's bringing the level of visibility up and people realize that this is a worthwhile investment of the, uh, the corporate resources. Other questions? Okay, well, uh, please do go to the URL anytime. You'll also see the community. The, when you go here, you'll see that there's a, a link for the community forum where you can go and interact with me and others anytime. Ask questions, post ideas, just you know, open uh, discussion. And uh, I hope you found this useful. And thanks a lot. Enjoy the rest of Cisco Live. Thank you, Charles.